Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I have Jeffrey Suckinger. How are we doing, Jeff? Doing wonderful. How are you doing? I'm I'm good. I'm you know we're, me and Jeff have been chatting. We can, we're actually really excited about this one because Jess has really a really unique story. I've I've actually been connecting with his team, so I kind of have a little bit of background. But I'm going to go ahead and let Jeff give his story. Jeff, go ahead and introduce yourself. Who is Jeffrey? Yeah. So currently, I'm 31 years old. I'm in Miami, Florida. I have uh, three different financial brands. Uh, one being an an asset management company. It's a hedge fund that owns. Uh, it's a management company that owns a uh, quite a few different uh, funds that have different strategies, mainly in, in currency markets. And then I've got a um, a funding company that uh, I've had for six years. That was actually my first like mainly successful company after leaving the corporate world and in, in uh, asset management. And then uh, I've got more recently a a software company for retail traders. So uh, that we build different types of trade management softwares and trading algorithms for traders to to you know make their lives more efficient and and hopefully more profitable as well. So those three different ventures is what I've been working on the last uh, six years, and so far has been uh, pretty great. But hoping to share some of my experience here today and uh, how I got here. Yeah, let's let's start from the beginning. You, you mentioned you were in the corporate yeah. world, and then you kind of went to the entrepreneurship world. Let's talk about that transition. How was that transition for you? Like, why did you decide to kind of transition out of corporate America into the entrepreneurship world? Yeah, so it's it's somewhat of a deep story. I don't, I don't want to spend the entire podcast no, on it. I love deep. Definitely I love do deep. That, but let's get it. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'll go about as deep as you can go. But uh, I I had a. Uh, I kind of forced myself out of the corporate world very quickly because I really didn't have another option. Uh, and the reason is because I got injured in in high school football and I uh, got prescribed uh, opiates. And that led to a, a time where I actually got addicted, uh, physically dependent on on those things throughout all of college and even into my workplace at my first major corporate job with the largest bank inside the United States. And it got to a point where it got uncontrollable and I had to actually go into a rehabilitation center. And during that process, I did a lot of, you know, self-development and realized that I had three, you know, everyone has a hierarchy of values. And I realized that my highest values were having freedom, options, and choices to do what I want with my time, energy, and resources, uh, seeing impact on other people. So I wanted my work to be meaningful. And, uh, and I wasn't, and I, well, you know, also wanted an uncapped earning potential, which I wasn't getting in a salary uh, job with no bonus. So I realized that that was, um, I, you know, the reason why part of the reason why I car I carried that problem from high school into college and then into the corporate world is I was escaping my own reality because I didn't have a reality that aligned with my values. So when I started to realize, Hey, Jeff, you actually value these top three things. And your entire life that you have right now is misaligned with those values. And that's why you're continuously down this problem of, of you know, essentially hurting yourself with different types of um, chemicals that originally you were prescribed from, from doctors. And it was just a, a problem that kind of avalanched over time. I realized I had to make a change. So when I got out of rehab, I said, all right, what aligns with my values? When I got out, I had credit problems because... I was actually, um, you know, I, I, I was I was always an entrepreneur from an early age. And then when I got into the corporate world, I stopped my, you know, different types of businesses. I sold shoes on Amazon. I did a lot of different, you know, random things throughout the, throughout the, the previous 23 uh, years of my life. And, uh, and I realized that, you know, I, I have credit problems coming out of that, that center. And I went back into the, the uh, workforce and realize that, okay, well, if I want to create that reality that aligns with my values, I need to do something. But first and foremost, how are you going to create a life that has, you know, freedom in it, if you're not even close to financially free, and you're in a bunch of debt. So I focused on my credit, I became a master at, at uh, repairing and fixing my credit. And then I built my entire first company around that process. So I raised my score from a 524 to a 793 in right around nine months. And I documented the entire uh, you know process of doing that and talked about all the things that I was doing in order to get my credit score higher. And then I built my entire first consulting company 
um, around that. So we consulted for early stage entrepreneurs to help them get access to financing. And it was anywhere between 50 and $300,000. And we did that through building a solid foundation on their personal credit profiles and then setting up businesses correctly so that they could go through a funding process in a few months, even a few months coming, you know, after they registered for the LLC. So that was our first, my first major company I still have today that, uh, that was, you know, successful. I had a, a few different ventures that failed before that. And, uh, and that was, you know, my, my problem became my purpose because I came out of that issue, had the credit problems, figured it out for myself, built an entire business around that and, uh, made more than eight figures running that company. So that, uh, that was my first start and, and first successful company. About a year after I started that company, I started a, a, my first hedge fund. Uh, once I you know, got out of debt, started to accumulate some, some money, um, I met with a, a, another uh, entrepreneur that I knew from middle school. And we launched our, our first hedge fund because I was always so interested specifically in the cryptocurrency uh, uh, industry. And we launched our first fund, and that was April of 2019. And uh, now we have several hundred and, and uh, limited partners across different funds under that one management company that we run. And then, you know, about a year and a half ago, I saw a really big opportunity to streamline some of our trading um, strategies into softwares because uh, I launched a, a, an educational product around trading. And people were highly interested in what I was, you know, different strategies of trading and, and things that I was doing with inside of our, our, our funds. And we built a, we built some of our strategies into softwares that, uh, that trade different currency markets and commodities like Bitcoin and, and uh, gold and, and then different uh, foreign exchange currencies. And then um, this is our most recent brand, which is a, a software company that retail traders, they, they pay a subscription fee to license that software and for them to you know, manage their own accounts with those tool, those trading tools. So um, that's a high level. I know it's a very indirect path uh, to success. I've probably had one of the more interesting stories to get to where I'm at today, but it shaped who I am. And uh, I really wouldn't have had it any other way because I've gone through a lot of adversity and I think the adversity that I went through really prepared me for all of the adversities that you experience when you're in entrepreneurship, because, you know, a bunch of unknown things happen and tough situations happen, and you've got to be able to push through that. And, uh, and that's something that I learned, you know, going through that tough process that I went through in my, you know, mid twenties. Yeah. I, I love that because I, I, you know, one of the things you mentioned, um, you know, is adversity. And I think, I think, you know, your people's character, the, is it becomes, it becomes a testament of their character of how they react to adversity, you know? And, and one of the things you mentioned is, is when you were in that rehab, you, you created your value kind of your pyramid, right? Your value pyramid. And one of the things you also mentioned is you really wanted to make sure whatever you built, you helped people. That was, that was kind of a really core value for you. Where did that passion come for helping people come from? I just feel like if you don't have purposeful work, I, I don't care that much about money. Like if I was just sitting in a, in an office collecting cash every single day, uh, even if it was a huge sum of cash, like at some point you, you're you human, you need to get more purpose out of life than just accumulating a bunch of cash. So like if you can have some purpose through your work and you feel like you're having a positive impact. Um, that's huge. If you can make, you know, a fair amount of money and also help people in the process, that's uh, huge in it. And like I said, you know, earlier, my problems became my purpose. And I think that's the most powerful thing that anyone can do is, you know, you have a problem in life, you overcome the problem yourself, and then you help others with that same, you know, type of problem. So, uh, so in my, in that circumstance, you know, it was my, my credit and my, my personal finances and then getting funding to start a, you know, one of my companies. So like that, uh, that going through that process is extremely fulfilling when you overcome something, you see how dramatically it impacted your life. And then you use that, you know, knowledge and skill set to also help others in similar circumstances do that. Uh, that's just a really, really fulfilling process. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And and now you, let's let's take it back to that first that first uh, uh, organization, the first entrepreneurship endeavor, the one where you're helping kind of the finance. Now, folks, this information will be available on the shades of e.com as well. So please subscribe to the newsletter. Now, I would love to hear kind of one, 
you, you mentioned you kind of started it and you're basically just, you know, nine months focusing on your own personal journey, your own finance journey. How did you begin to take that own? How did you begin to think about, you know what, I'm going to go into document this. And then how did you begin to actually take that documentation and turn it into a business? What you mentioned, you, you can uh, did some consulting work and you've been doing it now for six years. So you've, you've now mm -hmm. scaled this consulting group uh, pretty dramatically as well. So how did you begin first to kind of th start with the idea and say, you know what, I think I actually have something of value that I can sell. Yes. So I actually built, you know, one of the early stage things that I did when I was just about to leave corporate, this was before I was still in the corporate world. I mean, I tried to run the business while I was there. I declared an outside business activity and I was working for JP Morgan at the time. And they were like, Hey, you're going to be a competitor to some of our partners. And I'm like, well, you have thousands of partners. So how am I ever going to do anything without competing? Uh, -huh. uh so I, I just realized that there was no option you know so i i had to leave there if i wanted to start that company and that's what i did i i started even before i had any type of you know dependable uh cash flow and and how i documented it is i actually read a book uh called crush it by gary v where i'm sure you know who gary v is he you yeah. know talks a big big personal brand guy right and he talks about how your personal brand is your resume so i'm like that's so true. I really can't argue. He provided all these stories about all these people that, you know, created great businesses and impact and, and, you know, made a lot of money through their personal brands. And I'm like, this makes sense. Let's go ahead and do this. And I'm going to brand myself as the credit and finance expert as I go through this process. So I literally just broke down uh, my personal brand, which is mainly done through uh, Instagram at the time. And I said, and I, I just like literally started to talk about credit and all the things that I was doing with my own credit profile, showing the improvements that were occurring. I went through the six different factors of credit, talked about how those factors add up to your score and what impact they have and how you can tweak certain things in order to get those uh, six factors up. And, and I, and then I, you know, showed exact, you know, processes of, you know, how to accumulate more points on certain cards that you get and, how important it is to have debt on an LLC and not on your personal credit cards because then the utilization doesn't reflect on your personal credit score. And all of these things that a lot of you know consumers don't know and were not taught in high school and college, yep. which is unbelievable. I was the finance degree and they didn't teach me really anything about no. taxes, yeah. how to pay my taxes, how to optimize taxes, how to fix your credit score, how to, I mean, how do they not teach you about your credit score as a finance major? And I went to some, pretty decent schools. I mean, I didn't definitely didn't go to an Ivy League school, but I went to some pretty, uh, you know, good public education schools, and uh, they didn't teach me anything about uh, credit. So there's a big hole in, uh, in, in just with consumers in the United States, because you need a credit score to do almost everything. Yep. And I just talked about that entire process that I went through. And then I got to the point where people were like, hey, I see the value in what you're doing. And they said, do you have anything I can buy from you? And I'm like, no, I don't. Uh, but let me think about this. So then I launched a, a pre-sale to a program that I was going to release. And I talked about the different phases of the program and what it was going to do. And immediately, like right when I launched the pre-sale, uh, I, I think I made like five or six grand. And that was like within 24 hours. And I was like, wow, I guess I might have something here. Yeah. And then each week I built out that program and I would slowly raise the price of the program. And then, um, and then that really kickstarted my entire brand and, and, and then I started hiring employees and then everything just started to snowball from there. So it all launched off of my personal brand. And really because I read that book, uh, called crush it. Yeah. And Junior, it's kind of funny. I think I actually have that book here in the bookshelf behind me somewhere. Um, <laughs> now with that said, you know what I, I won again, folks, this information will be on the shades of e.com. So please subscribe to the newsletter, but I would love for you to, what is that current business name that you're, you're working on and kind of without, I certainly don't want you to sell the farm, but I would, there's probably some people listening that probably could utilize your service. So give them yeah. like, what's the elevator pitch? What's the company name? Kind of give them a little synopsis so they can understand what they'll be receiving from you if they join up with your team. Yeah, for sure. It's zero percent.com. So it's the number zero and then percent spelled out.com. And it's it's simply a, a consulting company that works with you to optimize your credit profile, set up the proper business if you don't already have one, and then go through a strategic funding process to get the lowest interest funding that you could 
possibly get. And our focus is anywhere between $50,000 and $300,000. That's usually the range because we're helping people with like very early stage LLCs, yeah. but we have different access and different, you know, companies that we work with that can get much larger amounts of funding. If someone actually has financials and they have cash flow, and they can prove that um, if they don't like have cash flow and they don't have finances, you can still get a fair amount of funding, but your personal credit profile, they're going to base a lot of the funding off your personal credit profile. So that's our, 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 uh, our main core focus is, we help early stage entrepreneurs get access to low interest financing, typically between five hundred or fifty thousand dollars and three hundred thousand dollars. And who is like primarily your target audience? Are you pretty business agnostic when it comes to entrepreneurs? Or are you looking like at specific industries? Yeah, a lot of different industries. Um, we don't have. I mean, there's only like a few high risk industries that we don't you know work with. But um, the majority of the companies that we work with are some type of they're either a consulting company, they're a marketing company, or they're an e-commerce based company. Those are like our top three, but that doesn't mean that we won't work with, you know, like a brick and mortar company or something else. But those, those types of businesses typically get higher amounts of funding because they're lower risk type businesses and they have less overhead. So like there's certain things that the lenders look for, not just in your credit profile, but in the type of company that you're starting that can impact, you know, the amount of, of funding that you get. And then for, for an entrepreneur that, you know, they're, they're, you know, trying to get funding, actually, let's take for your example, you, you started a, your consultant, what are some things that kind of surprised you during either trying to access funding or just going through and getting an LLC and starting your own business that you were kind of didn't know about when you started it? Yeah, tons of things. I mean, first of all, I didn't even think that it was possible to get funding on a company that didn't have revenue, which yeah. I yeah. quickly realized you can do that if your personal credit profile is in good shape. So I learned that process. I call, and then I, and then I call, uh, I, you know, pretty much um, claim the name strategic 0% financing. So you can also get financing through certain types of credit products that you don't pay interest on for six, 12, even sometimes 24 months. And you can use that in, in your you know business. Essentially you have free money for up to, you know, at the high end, it is 24 months. Typically, it's 12 to like 15 months. Uh, you're not paying any type of, of interest. So there are certain credit products that allow for that. And, you know, as an early stage business owner, you know, you've got to have an idea of how to make your, com your company, you know, profitable, like, you know, quickly, you don't want to take on a bunch of debt if you don't think that you can actually make money, right? But if you actually have a clear plan and you're confident in your plan, why would you not get some type of financing that's essentially free money from the banks by leveraging something that you could you've already built with your credit score or you can build no matter how bad your credit is because i can tell you like i said i had a I legitimately i had a 524 credit score and i i got it up close to it in 800 and, and not too long and then was able to go through a funding process to get hundreds of thousands of dollars so that um you know, that I didn't realize how, how quick it could be. Number one, how early stage of a company you could actually get financing on. And then the type of rates that you could, you could get um, in a, you know, short period of time, as far as like a, a you know, 0% or low, low interest uh, offers, you know, in a, in a 12 to 24 month mark. So those were the three major things. And then the other thing too, I didn't even know before I got into the credit game was that if you have, you know, a lot of people, they start business quick and they put it on their personal credit cards. You need to set it, things up the right way from the start, especially if you're planning on putting spend. I mean, first of all, sometimes they'll shut down your personal credit cards if you put business yeah. expenses yep. on them. So that could be a big issue. But number two is your utilization is, is a huge part, which is how, you know, how much credit do you have and how much of that credit are you actually using? Correct. And that's a huge part of your credit score. And if you're using a bunch of your outstanding, you know, credit and you have a big balance on your credit cards, your score is going to, you know, get tanked. So if you can move that over to a business that helps immensely in increasing your credit score because the utilization, AKA the a credit that you're spending on the business, on the business credit cards or business lines of credit are not reporting on your personal credit. So you can, you know, you leverage money without it negatively impacting your, your credit score.
Yeah, really, really smart. And folks, I, I got to say, you know, just a general rule of thumb for my own personal finances, I try not to exceed 30% on a credit card balance. Like that's anything over 30%, I, I begin to get worried uh, just because it tends to hit your credit score pretty pretty hard. Uh, but I do like, you know, the the option too, you know, working with your LLC. And then also there's grant funding available too for entrepreneurs, folks. You know, the Latino founders are nonprofit coming up, Pitch Latino and Pitch Banner coming up. So there's pitch competitions, there's grant funding, SBA has funding. So, you know, uh, get Get out there and network with folks and, and figure out, you know, how, what what's all available for you. Now, now, Jeff, you you also mentioned it is, is very interesting, kind of a, a really nice vertical integration, though, is, is you essentially doing the consulting and then you created a fund. Uh, and how did yeah. how did that transition occur and how do you create a fund? Well, I didn't plan it. Uh, I, I, it, it ha- <laughs> Luckily, everything had a lot of uh, synergy. So. Um, I mean, first of all, I started a uh, a Reg D. I've got a you know a Reg D 506B and a 506C, and and those are you know private placements. So typically, you pay a you know an, a, a, an attorney um, to start a fund that's usually between twenty and forty thousand dollars to start a fund, and that's typically the the cost. But if you're starting things like a Reg A plus, it could be seventy five thousand dollars. You know the range. It can vary, but it usually it's tens of thousands of dollars to start a fund. So I started that fund because I just had a deep passion for for trading and investing, and I saw how quickly blockchain was growing. And uh, before I, you know, got out of J- this is while I was at JP Morgan, but before I left the corporate world, I watched the huge run up that uh, crypto had from you know 2016 to 2017, yeah. and then the fall from 20 grand back down to like the low 3000s for Bitcoin, and I knew that that was not going to end there. Like people were saying, oh, that's the that's the, the industry's done, and I'm like, there's no way that it's done. I really think that this is a big trend that that's, that's going to see some serious adoption. So I'm like, I can see this vision of this industry growing rapidly. I'm already interested in it. I'm already invested in it. Why don't I start a fund with a guy that I trust and admire because of his ability to to trade and, and manage capital? And that's what I did. I, we started a fund just for ourselves. We're like, hey, this could be a viable business, but let's put money together first, prove a track record, and then let's start to raise money with that you know uh, track record that we build through the fund. Because you can't, you, you know, if you're talking to a potential um investor you can't market returns that are outside of what you built through you know a fund you can't show like personal stuff so like we're like hey let's just build a track record and if we do well then we'll start to you know raise money just from you know people that we already know in our network people have already done business with and it, and it made it pretty easy so it started very slow it's a long-term compounding business it's not an easy thing you don't make a bunch of cash flow from starting a fund you've got to have a lot of patience and you've got to earn a lot of trust with people. So uh, that, you know, this is like a, a longer term play and uh, it's, you know, it's played out pretty well. And we've done, we've done pretty well um, as far as the management side goes. And, and, and it worked out because I built these relationships through my consulting company. And then naturally, you know, there's networking opportunities. We had events every once in a while. And people would just ask me, you know, what I'm what I'm doing on 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 other ventures and with my investments, and I would let them know I I invest in my own hedge fund. They're like, what? Well, what is that? And then it's just an easy conversation. And uh, you know, a lot of the the investors that um, I we now have in our fund are clients that I built relationships over the past six years. So a lot of that came like that's another thing you got to think about is like the lifetime value of a customer. Uh, maybe it doesn't end just with that sale in one company. Like maybe there's indirect value that that's occurring in different areas. And uh, and it's not always maybe they funnel into another business. Maybe they bring you a key employee that, you know, helps helps your business grow or they make you, you know, you become a partner on a company with them. You know, there's there's a lot of indirect value of growing a network and building, you know, relationships in business. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I'm always encouraging the folks that are listening to you really get out and network and, and you know, meet with people, talk with people, share your ideas and, and get insights, uh, test your test your thesis, you know, uh, truly uh, see if you have a minimal vial product that people are willing to purchase, you know, and, and the only way you can do that is actually get out there in the community and test it in the market. And now, Jeff, one of the things you also mentioned, you know, so now you, you, you started, so you're doing consulting, then you started a fund, and then you 
you pivoted on another kind of vertical integration in a way. You created mm -hmm. software to help retail traders. Now tell us a little bit about that and what 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 kind of what is it called and what kind of program is it? Yeah, so it's a company called NURP. It's N U R P. Um, it's 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 a software company that any type of sometimes we have some businesses that become clients, but they're typically higher net worth retail traders that want to spend less time behind a computer, jump into a strategy that's, you know, built based on back tested data. And then they manage, they can help, you know, ma they manage that, that strategy on their own. So they're watching over their accounts or making sure that the strategy is functioning. They can adjust certain uh, position sizing and equity stop losses and things. So they can make adjustments based on their own risk tolerance and goals. And that's something, another huge trend that I saw in the marketplace that I knew was going to be a very big thing. And I knew that it had a lot of synergy with our uh, uh, fund. And I understood that, um, you know, it's going to add a lot of value, not only to that, enter you know, that enter enterprise value with inside of that company, but also in all of the research and data that come with it and how that's going to help, you know, our fund and our strategy moving forward as well. So, uh, so yeah, it was, it was another, you know, vertical integration, like you, you mentioned, and also another way, um, that, you know, I build relationships with clients and ultimately they tend, I, I tend to get other clients in my other companies as well. Uh, so it's kind of building somewhat of a flywheel, uh, as well. And, and, uh, and I realized too, that like, if you look at some of the wealthiest people in the world, I mean, especially if you're studying billionaires, they become billionaires through private equity. And a lot of them build, you know, these companies over many, many years, oftentimes, you know, a decade or two. And if you look at where a lot of the value is going, it's going where you get these high multiples. It's coming from recurring revenue. And a lot of times uh, that recurring revenue is some type of software as a service. So it, you know, as I studied some of the wealthiest people in the world and I, I want to make a move into that direction, I'm like, I also need to be in the right vehicles. And if the right V, if I can find the right vehicle that also has synergy with everything that I know and everything that I've done in my career, uh, then why would I, I uh, not, you know, build a team around uh, launching a brand that has synergy with my other companies, builds a lot of enterprise value, and then gets me in the right vehicle in order to get uh, to the, the, you know, growth that I want to have. So yeah, the, all those things are, are the main reasons why, uh, we started there and it's been a huge success since we started and very happy with the progress we made, but it's not an easy, definitely not an easy business. I don't think any businesses, but especially when you're playing it in financial markets, they move very quick and markets change. And, uh, there's a, you gotta have your, your fingers on the pulse and, and have a lot of smart people working for you. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I, you know, play at the market. I got a 403, 401, 457, you know, got the IRA kind of, you know, definitely play with the retail trader as well. Got my butt kick a couple of years ago and some short, some short tradings, but whoever, whoever, whoever doesn't get their butts every kicked every once in a while. And some oh, short oh. Trades. <laughs> I have been smoked many times too. Trust me. I mean, times where it uh, practically made my heart stop, but that's part of the game. Like you, you are going to take losses. And that's part of trading and investing. If you can't stomach losses, then you should just yep, completely you know, put agree. some cash under your bed and just let inflation erode away at it slowly. Exactly. I completely agree. So let's, let's stick on that train because I think, you know, there's a lot of probably retail investors. In fact, retail investing has gotten extremely uh, kind of popular within the last five years, you know, since the pandemic specifically, I'd say. What are yeah. what would you say are three reasons why blindly following the herd is an investment strategy destined to fail? Yeah, it's, I mean, when I first realized this, and I didn't realize this from an early age, I've been investing for over 10 years. Uh, but when you realize that all these financial markets that we're playing on, if you're on any type of broker or an exchange, you are playing something called a zero sum game, which means that in order for you to win, someone else has to lose. Right. So if you're listening and you're, and you're using group think to make investment decisions, like a perfect example is the Fed pivot, okay? If you look at the data, everyone's like, hey, man, when the Fed drops rates, that's going to make debt less expensive and people are going to borrow more and spend more money. And then the economy is going to go up in the stock market and everything's going to go up. And that's groupthink. That's what everyone 
primarily retail investors think, which to an extent, you're right in a very short period of time. If, but if you go look at the data, the majority of the time when the Fed is dropping rates because of recessionary fears and unemployment is on the rise and the Fed says, hey, it's time to pivot, let's, let's drop rates. If you look at what happens the majority of the time when they're making those big pivots and in interest rates, you usually see a big drawdown in the S&P 500 and other markets because they're dropping rates because something is seriously wrong. So contrary to the popular belief of the group think and the herd that all starts buying the top when they drop rates, markets are forward thinking. Okay, so they've already that's why we're seeing a big rally in the stock market already, because markets have been planning on this pivot in interest rates for the last, you know, six, nine months. So the market has already moved there. You're going to then buy the top. And a lot of the times you'll see the market sell off after a Fed pivot from these recessionary scares. And I, I think that's what's around, around the corner. But obviously, I don't have a crystal ball and everyone's got to make their own <clears throat> financial decisions. But that's just an example. Um, so, you know, when you realize that when you're doing what everyone else is doing uh, and, and you're following the herd, you're, you're typically, I mean, the best thing you could do is, 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 you know, be average. Uh, but a lot of the times you end up losing money because you're just, you're getting on the tail end of the herd and you've got to think, all right, how can I place capital in a place before everyone else places their money there? And that's, that's uh, the main, you know, thing you need to take away from trading and investing is you got to be forward thinking further than just like, oh, right when the Fed pivots, bam, why well, should buy the market? No, the, the market, the smart money was thinking that way nine months ago. Yeah, I agree. Don't you uh, having FOMO in trading is the worst thing to have fear, fear of missing out because you know, I think a, a lot of people ride the wave up. Uh, and if, if you look at um, folks, if you want to, I, Jeff, I think you're correct on what you're saying, because, uh, you know, Warren Buffett is a good example of, of this trend right now. If you look at the amount of stocks he's recently sold and the amount of cash he's hoarding right now, I generally assume something big is coming as well. Uh, so you can, again, I, if historically, you just kind of follow the market. It has its ups and downs, folks. I'm not saying not, not we're not trying to say this to uh, scare you from, from entertaining investment. Certainly not. Uh, we're, yeah. but we are trying to, you know, be educated, make sure you know what you're doing. Uh, and right, again, if you're doing long term investments, you know, look at the market, a 10 year span of any market in well, except for Intel right now, but look at a 10 year span of pretty much any market, and you're gonna have a pretty, a pretty, uh, you know, positive trajectory. So, so, Jeff, what's, you know, yeah, you got three businesses going, what's what's next? What what's what's on the future horizon? Honestly, just growing what we have and uh, making the products better and better. I mean, that's a that's a thing that will, is a never ending task. And the more that you focus on product, the less the easier everything is. Like if you have a great product, it makes everything ten x easier. So that's my primary focus is just focusing on product, building our team, getting the right leadership team in the right seats. And that's my objective over the next twelve months is just continuously hire better and better people. And, and uh and and grow everything that we have so i've got more than uh, enough on my plate and excited to just keep growing what i have and uh and again just hire people that are way smarter than me to help fulfill the 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 mission and vision that we have and, and I like the idea of going through SaaS, the the whole subscription model. Me personally, I like I love the subscription model. I'm trying to figure out ways like how do I personally myself get to the get get a product to the subscription model because like you're you're mentioning, it's just kind of reoccurring revenue, uh, especially if I have a good product or service. And and if you can create it, you know, automate it, have something that's already kind of built out, and uh, you certainly have to continue to adjust as the as the world and the market adjusts, but. I tell you, folks, a subscription model SaaS is is kind of the way to go if you're able to do it. Uh, really, again, a lot of work, but but really, really good. Now, Jeff, what what advice would you have for someone that's listening right now that's interested in becoming an entrepreneur? What advice would you have for them? Yeah, I mean, make sure that uh, what you do aligns with your values. I think that's that's number one. You know, I I, th I feel like I waste a lot of time early stage in my life doing things that I, I was doing just because I thought that it was like cool or the right thing to do, or like it would make my parents proud. Like at the end of the day, you got to make yourself proud and you got to do things that uh, align with your values. So if you don't have self-awareness, you're going to really struggle and you're probably going to waste a lot of time. And then realize that, you know, with entrepreneurship, uh, I, you know, I was, I, I think I did things to really 
the the right way as far as making my company profitable uh, very quickly. And but a lot of the times when you're launching something, you got to feed this organization and continuously invest back into the business. And your perspective, really, in my opinion, should be that you're jumping into a, at least a five year commitment. And you should think about your business as like a five-year investment that you're going to sacrifice a lot of things. Like you're probably going to have to stop, you know, spending a bunch of time on your weekends doing, you know, going to the beach and spending, going to every family vacation and all these weddings that you get invited to and watching Netflix in the evenings and doing, going out with your friends. I sacrificed all of that for many, many years. And I don't think people realize the sacrifice that you have to make early on. And, and I, I think that, a lot of times it takes like five years to build a solid leadership team where then you get some of your, your time back. So if you're going to make that leap, that's the type of perspective I think you should have is like, you're going to make, you know, a lot of sacrifice and it's going to take some time and you've got to be thinking in at least a five year time horizon uh, before you really start to see like the compound effect and the fruits of your labor play out. Yeah. And I got to tell you folks, I started this podcast, what, three and a half years ago, uh, you know, still scaling it, just got brought on my first employee that helps with, uh, you know, the editing of the stuff. Uh, but, you know, again, it, it takes a lot of time. Um, but th at the same time, it's something I'm fun. I love, I do, I love doing it. It's passionate about, like, you know, Jeff mentioned, and I think the passion is important because when you have those moments of self-doubt, it's, it's going to, it, that's just the passion is going to want to kind of propel you forward to not give up. Now, Jeff, have you ever had a moment of self-doubt throughout your entrepreneur career? Yeah, all the time. I mean, it happens all the time. And, uh, and, and you know, it, it it's sometimes you get in a place where there's, there's many things that can help you get through it. You know, being around other people that are doing similar things and having success, you can give you a lot of inspiration. So I, I'm a big fan of finding a circle and a network around you that is doing similar things that you can feel like, oh, you went through that problem, same thing here. And then you can like get feedback from them and, and learn a lot quicker. So that was one of the great things that I did is I surrounded myself with a small network, but it was a really good network of people my age that were growing different companies helped immensely in my learning curve and also getting through that, you know, self-doubt. And then, you know, just listening and, and feeding your mind. People talk about the diet that you feed your body. How about the diet that you feed your mind? I think that's even more important. So like what I'm talking about is listening to positive, uh, you know, affirmations, listening to people like Jim Brown, uh, Jim Rohn and Les Brown and Tony Robbins and things that you're talking, they're talking about personal development and perseverance and, and doing those things instead of every once in a while, you know, not listening to music on the way uh, to your job or to your business. Listening to those types of things can really help alter your belief systems because ultimately, you know, what you believe in your head then determines your thoughts, words, actions, habits, and destiny. So if you have a really strong belief system in yourself, you can get over those times of self-doubt. Uh, but if you don't have the, that belief system there and you're not confident in yourself because you're not keeping the promises that you make to yourself and staying disciplined, then it's going to be a lot harder to get over that self-doubt. Yeah, folks, we are we are the average of the 10 people we hang out with the most, you know, and, and so make sure you surround yourself with a lot of good positivity. And uh, I agree, Jeff, you know, like, you know, making sure you're even positive with yourself. I think that's really important. We're, we are our own worst critics. It's very easy for us to get on ourselves for things that we've done. Um, but you also, it's it's very imperative for you to take a moment to take a step back and, and look uh, in the rearview mirror of all of the accomplishments you have done throughout your life. Uh, and, and if you need to, by all means, throughout the year you know if you do something great through a day write a note down and put it in a bucket and so at the end of the year you have a bucket full of these little notes that you can go pick out and say wow these are all the things i accomplished this year because again having that um that reassurance and continuing to build upon that as jeff mentioned you know it will eventually creates its its own its own kind of energy right you kind of create your own aura of positivity and and things start to go well you know, one of the things I've changed recently, completely honest, Jeff, is I do my bed every morning. I wake up every morning, I make my bed. And I feel like that 
just that accomplishment has been doing a lot. I put um, one of those, uh, the money trees next to my bed now as well. It's just been sprouting and just, you know, doing, I've been working out about three days a week or, you know, trying four days a week now, or this month is my goal is three days a week, but with, with a three-year-old and an 18 month year old, it's always difficult, but, you know, just, you know, trying to get into uh, routines, you know, I would say I always encourage people to try to get into routines because once you kind of get into routines, you become, you know, focused on those routines. It, as I, Jeff mentioned, you become better uh, because again, you're learning from either yourself or you're learning from someone else. So uh, again, keep on moving. Now, folks, again, all this information will be available on the Shades of Entrepreneurship website, theshadesofe.com, including a transcription. Now, Jeff, if folks are interested in learning more about you, maybe they want to connect with you online or they want to find your website, what, what is your information? How can they get a hold of you? Yeah, I mean, I, I post a lot of my life on uh, on Instagram. So if you just look me up there, just my name, Jeff Seconder. Uh, um, I post stuff on there. I post different types of personal uh, development content, uh, mindset things on on threads, which is you know through the the new Instagram app. So you could get some value there. If you're more like finance and uh, and you know investment focused, I, I'm on X as well. I talk more about finance and investments and things like that there. And uh, and then just my different brands, you know, mainly zero um, percent.com and and NERP. And then our fund doesn't really have a website because we don't we just don't need to. So yeah, uh, yeah. so yeah. So the, I would say those are the best places. Perfect. And again, folks, with all this information will be available on the shades of e.com. So please be sure to subscribe to the shades of entrepreneurship. Uh, you can also become a patron for $5 a month. You can help support the show on Patreon. Again, the shades of e.com. And you can follow us on at the shades of e on all the social channels. Now, uh, Jeff, before we leave, is there any last words you'd like to say for the listeners? Um, no, I, I mean, my big thing is just like, you know, I, I'm so happy that I went through that those you know challenges and, and tribulations that I did because I got to know myself better and when you know yourself better and you've got that self-awareness and you know what you truly value it makes life uh, a thousand times easier because you're doing things that you truly care about and at the end of the day it's your life and you got to design your life around the things that you know matter and that, that you value yourself so if you could build your career around things that align with what you value it's going to make your life so so much better. I agree. I agree. You know, uh, uh, the difference between a job and as a career is a job is something you do for money and a career is something you're passionate about doing. Right. And just get yeah, for so. Uh, so just, you know, continue to go out there, folks, work, network. Uh, there's a lot of people out there in the community that want to see you succeed. Uh, so make sure you go out there and, and, you know, break some bread with those folks. And again, folks, all this information will be on the shades of e.com website. Jeff, thank you again so much for joining the show. Really appreciate it. And, and, for those, again, I, I would say everybody listening, congratulations on your sobriety. Phenomenal uh, story. I know that that's probably been a, a lot of work. Uh, awesome, dude. Honest, truly awesome work, what you're doing. And and me personally, I'm going to go check out your website because I love to trade as well. So I'd be very interested in, in your retail uh, trading software. Again, I told you I got my butt kicks in short, so I need to make that money back. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. and folks, you can subscribe to us at theshadesofe.com. You can go ahead and visit Patreon, become a patron for $5 a month. Thank you and have a great night.